a tremendous happy Mother's Day to all of the incredible mothers out there. Get that fucking trash out of your life. You have legacies to build. We grew that business from 3.4 million to 17.1. Horsepower, not horse shit. You want to be the parent that's an ally. They don't need another fucking friend. Not everybody's cup of whiskey. Toughest advice for the toughest businessman. Be relentless. I think this is the most important day of the year because I believe that mothers are the most important people in our world. I think of the incredible blessings in my life and they all turn back to me winning the lottery in terms of my mom. My mom, Eva McLean, is 98 years young. My mom will be turning 90, uh, sorry, 89 years old, and she'll be turning 90 uh, later this year, just before Christmas. 90 glorious years young. I think back to my mom and I have so many fond and incredible memories. My mom is the COO of our family. If my dad is the chief executive officer, the CEO, my mom is the COO, the chief operating officer. We grew up the first years of my life, the first five years of my life, I grew up in the back of a general store in a tiny village in Canada. Those first five years of a person's life, they say anywhere from age three to age seven, a person's character is set. They say in those first three to five to seven years, a boy or girl's character is set and it's set for life. And I believe this to be true. And I am so thankful that I spent those first five years, those formative years of my childhood, age zero to five, growing up in the back of a general store watching my dad head out to, we, we lived in the back, head out to work for 7 a.m., seven days a week, and come back in after closing the store at 9 p.m. 14 hours a day, seven days a week, every single day but Christmas. My dad ran that store for five years. I never once can remember, nor can my sister, nor can my mom remember him ever complaining, ever whining, ever making any excuses, ever talking about the long hours and the, the endless work, none of it. The work was the reward. He knew he was on the way to something better and this was part of the journey. Seven days a week, 365 every day but Christmas. But none of that works without my mom running the family in the background. We lived in a tiny house attached to the back of the store. So I remember my dad would come in and have lunch with us and then he'd have to run out anytime somebody pulled up for gasoline or somebody came in for a fishing license or came in for to buy some food or something to drink. And my dad would do the same thing at six o'clock at night. He would come in, my mom would have food on the table and my dad would try and sit down. And as soon as he had his first bite of dinner, he would always have to jump up. The bell would ring that black cord uh, where the gas pumps were. People would pull up for gasoline, for their vehicles, for their boats, for their motors, uh, buying cigarettes, you know, Coke, Pepsi, you name it. 
it was just uh it was a busy 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 place and what a amazing time to look back on but really when i think about it my mom ran the entire show she she made a commitment with my dad to raise my sister my older sister Catherine and myself at the time and then my younger brother David came along a few years later but she raised my sister and I in the back of that store she took care of everything she was the CEO of inside the family and it allowed my dad to put in those extreme 14-hour days knowing that he didn't have anything to worry about except the work itself. He didn't have to worry about meals or groceries or ball games or hockey practices. My dad would slip away and take us to those things. I can't remember my mom or my dad ever missing something at school or ever missing something with our sports. But my mom was the master organizer she's one of the most intelligent people that i have ever had the privilege of knowing my mom was an outstanding student but my mom and dad were born in the depression my mom was born in 1933 which were the first years of the depression when my mom talks about, you know, she laughs when she hears about tough times in the last 50 years. She, she laughs when she thinks about how soft we've become as a society. We talk about, you know, uh, we whine and complain about having to sit in traffic or our, our Uber driver is five minutes late or our food that's been delivered to our door is five minutes late. And she grew up and she was born in 1933 at the start of the depression. She knows what food lines look like. She knows what bread lines look like. She knows what gasoline lines look like from the 70s. She's been through double digit inflation. She's been through uh, wars. She's been through all of it and it's amazing the reference both my parents have because of the fact they've been through it all full circle over 90 years but my mom like my dad just went to work every day she is an incredible mom she's a she used to read to us she turned us on to books she turned us on to literacy she she really anything and everything for her children she literally was, is the type of person where my mom had a great job before her first child, my sister. She was working at the courthouse. She had a nice government job. Uh, she could have worked at that for 40, 50 years. She would have ended up with a nice financial pension. It was a great job in a small town. And my mom, on by choice, uh, surrendered all of that when my sister was born and I remember my mom telling my dad she says you know I now have the most important job in the world because my dad would often say are you interested in returning to work we'll work it out uh, I'll work less hours or I'll do some we'll adjust we'll make it work and I just remember my mom saying a couple of times are you kidding me? I now have the most important job in the world, which is raising our children. And my mom never, ever returned to that job again. She raised my sister, myself, and then my younger brother came along. And my I, I can't remember a time when we got off the school bus that my mom wasn't waiting for us in the house. We would head up, we would run up the driveway, we'd put, we, we'd put on our roller blades or whatever, grab our bat and glove. We were always outside playing, especially after school. But I can't really remember one single time when we came running through that door at the end of the school day, getting off the bus that my mom wasn't waiting for us. With a snack, with a smile, with a how was your day? 
And man, that has an impact on a child. Just that feeling of security at a young age that your mom is there. When you get off that school bus, you're in kindergarten, you're in grade one, you're in grade four, and she was always there. And then with my brother coming along five years later, she was there through all of our teenage years. Always there to listen, always there to give a piece of advice, always there to, to just, you know, to help us and support us, to drive us. She never stopped. We live 15 minutes out of town and I laugh at those, the, the car never stopped. Literally, my dad was working in the insurance business when we were teenagers and my mom was a road warrior. She had three children that needed to be at hockey practice, baseball practice, football practice, piano practice, theater practice, you name it. And somehow my mom was able to do it all on her own. She was, she was just, the road never, the, the, the wheels never stopped turning on that car. So I can't, I'm so grateful that I won the lottery when it came to my mom. I think about her being raised, her father, my grandfather, Hillis Conroy, ran a general store as well. So it's a unique story that not only did I grow up in the back of a, a general store watching my dad and mom work, but also that my mom, born in 1933, that she also, her, her father, ran a general store which was next door to their home and they lived you know like he he was like my father he worked the hundred hour week to put food on the table and to put clothes on their backs and i remember him as a very independent man he used to say to us uh, to my younger brother and i he said you know i don't mind putting in the 90 hours the 100 hours a week he said at least i'm free at least I'm free. I sign my own paycheck. If I want to take a couple hours off to go fishing, if I want to take an afternoon off to go hunting, I can do it, Michael. I'm not a, I'm a, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a bootlicker. I'm not a corporate bootlicker. And uh, I think that that's where my mom's incredible work ethic came from. My mom's home. It's like. It's like walking into the Alabama Crimson Tide locker room, or it's like being around Duke University when Coach Krzyzewski's running things. It's, it's, it's sterling and it's sparkling. Everything my mom touches, she makes better. And it's just an amazing, her vehicle, her home, her kitchen, her bedroom. You know, now and when we were growing up, everything was, everything screamed excellence and to this day you know my mom stopped driving two years ago so she drove up until age uh, 87 think about that she was driving in the city two years ago at age 87 and she's driving a hundred thousand dollar sports car and my mom got a speeding ticket at age 86. So uh, about three and a half years ago, my mom was pulled over. She drives uh, an Audi 3000, whatever XL, I don't know. It's a beauty. And my mom's always had a heavy foot, as they say. She, uh, she drove three kids to all their sports for 20 years and she would get to town, it's 15 minutes to town, she would, she would get there in 10. And it's interesting, only three, three years ago, maybe four years ago, uh, she, I remember her telling me off the cuff, she said, I got a speeding ticket, Michael. And I was like, you got a what? And he, she's like, I got a speeding ticket. I said, mom, you're 86, you got a what? She said, well, the police officer knocked it down, but I was going so fast that he had no choice but to at least charge me for the minimum. So she got charged for like $85. And it would have been a $400 fine. Like she was ripping, right? She's playing offense. She's, uh, she's not playing not to lose. 
she's uh, she's swinging for the fences. She had to get to town. So she gets pulled over and she's probably going, you know, 70 miles, 75 miles an hour. And she gets pulled over by this police officer. And my mom, she's, she's 89, but she looks like she's 70. She literally looks like she's 70. When she was here for nine days with my dad in Naples when we flew them in, uh, Emery came running to my daughter. Emery came running to me one time and she said, she goes, grandma just tied her shoes on one foot. And I was like, grandma just tied her shoes on one foot. What do you mean? Well, Emery and her were heading out with the dog for a walk and grandma put on her shoes and without even thinking, she stood on one foot, okay, one foot, grabbed the other foot and pulled it up, didn't lean on the wall, slipped on her walking shoe and tied it, all while balancing on one leg. And then she did it for the other one. And here's my 10 year old who is just absolutely blown away by this. She's like, grandma can tie her shoes standing on one leg, not touching the wall, not having any support. And I said, yep, that is your grandma. That is your grandma. She can touch her toes. She can do a Hindu squat. She can, she looks and acts like she's 70. It's been very difficult the last handful of years with my mom suffering from dementia, as I've shared a couple of times. But even there, she's just been such an incredible warrior where they thought it was a diagnosis where they said, you know, they told my dad, they said, get your things in order. You're going to have to sell your home. You're going to have to move into a retirement facility all in 12 months. And it's been six years. They still live independently in the house that we were raised in. They still live outside of town. My dad is still driving. Um, they're 100% on their own and independent at age 89. And even when it came to that crippling diagnosis of dementia, my mom has fought that every step of the way. I believe that iron will comes from the general store upbringing she had. I believe that iron will comes from her mom and her dad. I, I, I just believe that there's something special there where when somebody, when they're faced with a challenge, it's like, no, no, that's not the way it's gonna go down. This is the way it's gonna go down. So it's incredible. My, uh, we used to affectionately, I guess I'll say affectionately now, we used to affectionately call my mom the iron lady behind her back. And when we were growing up, it was the Margaret Thatcher days in England. And Margaret Thatcher, of course, was one of my mom and dad's favorite politicians. They don't have favorite politicians, but Thatcher was special, right? The Iron Lady, no, no, no nonsense. And it's amazing because my mom, we called her behind her back, the Iron Lady. And she knew it and she was so prideful. She was like, yeah, I am the Iron Lady, don't forget it. In 20 years of raising three children, I never once heard my mom ever threaten to call my dad, ever. The Iron Lady always took care of her own business. You know how some of these other moms, well, oh, I'm gonna call your dad, he's gonna come home, and, and when he comes home, there'll be hell to pay. Never once. The Iron Lady took care of business. The COO took care of her own business. She never once threatened to call my dad. She took care of business. The COO never called for backup. And as kind and compassionate and empathetic as my mom is, it's amazing how tough she is. I use the word iron. I use the word iron. Coming from the background that she came from, her parents being extreme hard workers, living a simplistic life, not having she didn't have the opportunities to play the piano. She didn't have the opportunities to go to college or university. She didn't have any of those opportunities that we were given and now my daughter's given. She didn't have any of those opportunities. They went to school and they did chores. 
They went to school and they worked. And at grade 12, you started your life working. And that was it, period. And you were out of the house when you were 18. So I think that's, I not think, I know that's where my mom's grit and toughness comes from. She does not suffer fools. It's amazing. I always tell the joke, the old uh, Bill Cosby joke, good morning, about uh, people now. Like if I'm at skating with the school kids, I teach my daughter's school skating and the parents will all be gathered around at five o'clock at night. I teach skating once a week with the kids and all the parents of the kids will be there and they'll be meeting my mom and talking to my mom. Because my mom and dad come in and watch Emery. They're just fantastic grand grandparents, right? Involved and, and interested. And people will come up to me and they'll be like, Michael, I met your mom. What a lovely lady. Oh, Michael, I, I met your mom. What a beautiful person. <laughs> and I'll always stop them dead in their tracks and say, oh, no, that's not my mom. I go, that's an old person that's trying to get into heaven. And they, it just, they, they just drop dead. It's like, oh no, no, that's not my mom. That's not the Iron Lady. That's an old person who's, who's trying to get into heaven. And it's so funny how empathetic my mom has been become in her 80s. Like she's just a different person, right? She's lost that edge. She's lost that chip on the shoulder. She's, she's lost that dark side fuel. She doesn't need it anymore. She's a grandma. She's a great grandmother, by the way, for the first time three months ago. But my, my mom doesn't, she doesn't have to be the COO anymore. Her children are raised, they're successful. Uh, her and my dad are living independently. She's, she's now just enjoying her days. And she doesn't have to be on duty. She doesn't have to be on call. And I've just watched that sharp edge over the last 20 years disappear. The Iron Lady has retired. The Iron Lady has retired. No, that's not my mom. That's just an old lady trying to get into heaven. So I always make them laugh with that one. Man, oh man, Emery looks up at hockey and there's grandma sitting in the stands. Emery looks up at power skating. There's her grandma sitting in the stands. We flew them in here for nine days uh, to spend time with Emery and myself and Krista. Man, it's just amazing the power of a mother. I hope that, uh, I hope your mother is still with you. I hope that, uh, uh, I hope that uh, you have a great mother in your home. If your mother has, uh, has passed, passed on, I hope that you have incredible memories of your mom that you can continue to pass on to your children. Videos and photographs and albums. Tell stories about your mom. You know, nobody's perfect. Uh, I, uh, Krista lost her mom four years ago, the day before Mother's Day, so that's been something that's been incredibly difficult for Krista and for all of us losing her mom four years ago. But we, we keep the memories of her alive um, with photographs and videos and stories. I like to sit at the kitchen table at night and I like to tell stories about things. And one of the things that I like to talk about is the, uh, the mothers and the grandmothers and tell, uh, tell stories because we're hardwired to uh, to remember stories. We're hardwired to uh, um, to learn by listening to stories. So keep your keep your stories alive. Whether your mom is still with you, whether you're um, you know any of that stuff. And uh, I hope you're blessed with a great queen in your family who's also an outstanding mom. I'm so proud of my wife Krista. And I think about it on Mother's Day, how uh, I take it for granted sometimes that she's just this amazing, mentally tough, calming and poised woman. She brings so much calm and mental toughness and perspective to our home. It's incredible. I'm a wear it on your sleeve kind of person and she's a 
calm and introspective kind of person. And I see it in my daughter where she's such a calming influence. She makes, uh, she makes us all feel secure. She makes us all feel safe. She makes us all feel loved. And she does it in a calm, loving and compassionate way. We're an amazing team because we're incredibly different people. But man, oh man, Emery and I are so blessed to have Krista in our life. And Emery, Emery has an incredible, incredible mom. So happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Make sure you do something special for your queen. Make sure you, if your mom is still living, make sure you do something special for your mom. Make sure you tell a story. If your mom is gone, tell a story about your mom that brings her, brings her back on this important day. Tell your kids about grandma, remember, remind them about grandma. Even talk about great grandma, we do that a lot. Where we tell stories of great gram, Krista's uh, grandmother and man, your kids will be all ears, whether they're, whether they're teenagers or adults. Tell stories today about your mom. Tell stories about your grandmother, their grand, great grandmother. Tell stories and shine the spotlight on the most important people in your life. And uh, it never hurts to wish all the mothers out there a, a happy Mother's Day. They truly are the badasses in our world. I, I, can't, I can't think of one super success story. I, I work with top 1% men all over the world. I've done it for now for 10 years. And there's no exceptions. They all have incredible ride and die queens. They have incredible mums, past and present. They have incredible grandmothers, past and present. Just that, that COO of their life, that leader of their life, that iron will in their life, that compassion and empathy in their life. We're all incredible. We're all incredibly blessed to have amazing, amazing, strong women in our lives. Amazing, amazing, strong women in our lives. So happy Mother's Day to all of the incredible mothers out there. I have one question for you that you need to answer before the last day of May. If nothing changes in your life financially in the next three months, six months, next year, maybe next, what if nothing changes in the next three to five years financially? Will you be okay with that? If your answer is a hell no, I won't be okay with that, Michael, you need to go to emailmillions.coach and register for my 12 month Email Millions Mastermind. It's the honey that brings in the money. It is what I call the marketing eighth wonder of the world. Building an email list, building a relationship with that list and emailing it once a week, twice a week, whatever. And literally, literally flooding your company, your business with leads, referrals, prospects, and buyers, plus cash flow, lots of cash flow every time you press send, and literally flooding your business with buyers and prospects that are begging to buy your products and services. I did it in the insurance business. I built the number one insurance agency in the country, 90% by email. I built my award-winning barber shop by email. I built this consulting company over the last three years by what? Daily email. I did it, my hockey team, I took it from the outhouse to the penthouse, last in attendance to first in attendance by email, 90% plus of my marketing, my income, the money that comes into my companies, all generated by one thing, a simple plain text daily email. You don't need to shoot a video, in fact, you shouldn't shoot a video. You should just send a plain text email once a week maybe, twice a week maybe. Do it daily like I do if you want. 
It's literally 10 minutes sitting down in your boxer shorts at your kitchen table and pressing scent. You can literally write yourself a swimming pool, write yourself a vacation, write yourself a golf membership, write yourself a trip to Europe, write yourself a payment for your child's college education, write yourself another vehicle, write yourself a lake house. You can literally sit down for 10 minutes, write simple plain text emails, and the, they are the, the honey that brings in the money. And I started with all my companies with zero emails, zero. It's no excuse. I know you don't have an email list and if you do, it's a mess, we're gonna fix that. I'm gonna write an email for you every week of the year, 52 emails, 52 weeks. All you have to do is buy the software, put in your emails every day, you start at zero, then you have 25 emails, then 100, then 300, then 500, then 1,000. Look at that sunrise. And next thing you know, every time you press send, you're literally flooding, flooding your business with an avalanche of leads, referrals, buyers, and cash flow. And cash flow equals peace of mind, right? Cash flow equals peace of mind. You need to pay a tax bill, send an email. You need to make payroll, send an email. You need more money for marketing. You wanna test TV, you wanna test radio, you wanna test print, send an email and generate some cash flow to pay for it. That's what I did in all my businesses. Michael, how did you send hundreds of thousands of flyers and thousands of newsletters? How did you afford it? One answer, the honey that brings in the money. Email would flood the place with cash flow, and I would use some of that cash flow to test other marketing, other advertising, other promotions. Oh, and by the way, email is a great way to raise funds in your community. As you may or may not know, my daughter just raised $5,700 last week for the Conservancy Nature Reserve here in Naples, Florida. That's almost $6,000 a 10 year old made with my email list. By sending simple plain text emails, we were able to raise almost $6,000 for her charity. Last time we did a lemonade stand uh, at the barber shop, she raised $9,000 by, what is it? Plain text emails. Also, you got hiring problems. Let me solve your number one biggest headache in business, hiring good people. You're having a hard time finding good people. You're having a hard time keeping good people. That all goes away when you build an email list. Where did we hire? Where do we hire all of our great people from? If I don't recruit them personally, I send out emails with a link, a simple link to a video page to hire. That's how I would hire a receptionist. That's how I would hire a service person. That's how I hired barbers. That's how I hired all kinds of different people. When I needed somebody, first thing I would do is send out an email. 10 minute plain text email with a link to the Help Wanted site. Next thing you know, our business is swamped with highly qualified applicants. That's how I, that's how I recruit it. 60% of my team, 40% one-on-one, -on -one, you know, like a, you know, finding Leanne or finding Mark Andre and hiring them, but the other 60%, okay, the other 60% is done by email. So, man, oh man, it is the honey that brings in the money and it solves a lot of the problems that make a hard pillow. You get rid of your debt, you get rid of your, um, you get rid of any cash flow problems and you swamp your business with constant hot leads. An absolute avalanche, a fire hose of leads, referrals, buyers, uh, and cash flow. And buyers that want to, that insist that you send, that you, uh, you they, they insist that they wanna buy your products and services. Email millions.coach, email millions.coach. If, uh, if nothing changes in the next six months, the next 12 months, the next three years, will you be okay with that? If it's a hard hell no, 
sign up at emailmillions.coach. I've made it so simple. 147 for outsiders, civilians. $97 for insiders. Your newsletter subscriber or you're part of my mastermind. That's like $3 and 25 cents a day. That's a coffee a day. And I'm gonna write the emails for you. And I'm gonna train. I'm gonna do a private training once a month. I'm gonna teach you how to eventually do this yourself. There's nothing I'm not gonna teach you. I'm gonna teach you how to build the list, the software to use, how to write the emails, when to send the emails, how to sell in the emails, how to teach in the emails, how to build a bond in emails for the price of a coffee per day. Emailmillions.coach. It's at least half full. I'm capping it at 100 businessmen and entrepreneurs. You better get your ass in gear. Emailmillions.coach. By the way, it's monthly. If you don't find its valuable, if you don't like the return on investment, if it's not flooding your business with business, then you can cancel any time. There's zero risk. You're on the hook for the first month. 147 for outsiders a month, 97 for insiders. Emailmillions.coach. You better get on it. Uh, immigration closes the last day of May. That's it. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the incredible female COOs, probably some CEOs as well out there of the family. Happy Mother's Day to my mom and to my wife, Krista. God bless all the amazing mothers out there. God bless you and your family. And make sure that you, uh, you thank your mom today. And if she's, if she's not here, make sure you talk about her and tell a story so that uh, you, uh, you remember her and, uh, and you shine the light on her today. That's it. Two words that changed my life. Two words that will change your life. Happy Mother's Day. Be relentless.